Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our talk this afternoon. I'm Roger Barge. I'm the general manager for Amazon Kinesis Data Streaming Services. And we have a number of speakers here today to help give this presentation. Just a few words about what the content is. We will be giving you an over overview of Amazon Kinesis Video Streams. We'll talk about the key use cases for which the service has been designed. We'll go into a little bit deeper dive on the product details. We actually have a customer case study and demonstration at the end from Abijah, which I think you're really going to like as well. Now, many of you may know that Kinesis is Amazon's data streaming platform. In 2013, we launched our first service, Kinesis Streams. Today, it is a foundational service for AWS. If you use AWS, you use Kinesis. All of the billing, metering, records flow through Kinesis, CloudWatch logs, CloudWatch metrics, S3 events, over a dozen services in AWS and Amazon run on top of Kinesis, and we stream petabytes of data in each and every day. In 2015, we released Kinesis Firehose, which will, within minutes, deliver that data to AWS services, and we announced just a couple days ago that now Splunk is a destination for Firehose. So we have S3, Redshift, Elasticsearch, Splunk, and many more to come in the future. The third service is Kinesis Data Analytics, which actually performs streaming SQL in a serverless fashion over data coming through a Firehose or coming through in a Kinesis stream. So you can do real-time stream processing and analytics. We also have machine learning algorithms in the service as well. But we started to notice over the last year that video is an incredibly rich and useful source of information. Just a few examples, smart homes, smart cities, security monitoring, industrial automation, computer vision, and it's not just video, LIDAR, radar for smart cars. This is an important source of information and customers were asking, how can we get it? how can Kinesis help us with that? Because it's actually quite challenging. And you'll notice also in each one of these scenarios, it's not just the video, it's also the data coming in, the, the data streams as well. So this is a very nice complement to the existing Kinesis services we have today. But if you stop for a moment and say, hey, what does it actually take to do this? Why can't we just roll our own? First pause and think about how, how you stack and rack multiple machines that are gonna capture this video, that are gonna store this video. Think about tinkering with the software on the video camera and then starting to write the software to actually ingest this data. And think about what it would take now to scale that up to thousands tens of thousands, millions of cameras, which we fully expect are both out there today and will be there in the future. This service has to be infinitely scalable. And you also have to handle all the intricacies of handling with video, like cadence, latency, jitter on the stream, and be able to handle that in a seamless fashion as well. And of course, it's video. This is actually a very, it has to be highly secure. We do not want this video to ever be obtained or leaked out to somebody. So you have to be secure, highly scalable, and you want to have storage options. This video may be something you play back immediately to your customers. You may want to store it for 30 days, 60 days, be able to specify the retention period for this video, and do so in a very cost-effective manner. And then to build applications, you need to have very easy-to-use APIs to retrieve the data, to process it, to replay it, search for it for any point back in time and replay it again. So it was these requirements and this understanding of what was difficult for customers and the struggles that they were facing that shaped Kinesis Video Streams. So Amazon Kinesis Video Streams will stream video and any time encoded data for analytics. Again, radar, LIDAR, satellite, any time encoded data. It can stream from millions of devices. It allows you to easily build applications. It is secure durable and searchable storage for retrieving and playing back that video. It's fully managed, it is serverless. And Ken, as you can see in this simple illustration, hundreds of cameras potentially streaming into the service. You can attach Amazon AI services to the incoming video streams, Apache MXNet, TensorFlow. You can bring your own custom video processing or third-party partners can also bring their, process, their processing to process this video as well. At this point, I'm going to stop and I'm going to turn the mic over to Adi Krishnan, who's the head of Kinesis Video Streams. Thank you, Roger. Uh, thank you, everybody, for taking the time out and, and joining us today. So, let's, uh, so wh why did we go about doing all of this? And some of the key motivations came from, from several customer use cases uh, that, that, we, that we learned about. Uh, one use case that we learned uh, a lot about from different varieties of customers was how do we make our homes smarter? 
Uh, so how many of you today have some variety of a home security camera device? A show of hands. I'd say about 25%. And I'm sure some of you will be get, getting those gifts this Christmas season or you buying some for somebody else. And one of the things that we learned is, is that with this proliferation of image sensors across a variety of devices, customers really want to attach intelligent analytics to these incoming video streams to build things that are of ultimately of customer value. So in this case, this is an example of a pet monitoring solution. Uh, you probably, some of you probably saw the uh, dog or cat demo with, the, with deep lens. And, and this is something that's very real. Uh, customers want to know if their pets are happy or not, if they've uh, actually eaten their food or not, or if, they've, or if they're fighting over the same bowl of food. These are all very real things, and, and pet owners are passionate. How many of you have pets, by the way, dogs or cats? More than those who have security cameras, not surprising. Um, and, and what customers want to do is integrate those video devices and not just ingest that video stream data to view what is happening at home, but also to then generate things like clips of interest, uh, to do more interesting things like, is my puppy playful enough? Or is my puppy taking a nap? Uh, and these are all kinds of activities that can now, because of the capabilities of real-time ingestion and storage, offer up customers the ability to process them. Another example is from the uh, smart city domain. And here specifically, uh, customers have asked us about how do we build the next generation of an Amber Alert system. So for those of you who are not from the US, the Amber Alert system is something that's used specifically uh, in the event of a missing child. And, and in this scenario, uh, what customers want to do is immediately detect, based on a suspect's license plate reader, license plate, and the make and model of the vehicle to give all cameras the sort of intelligence to say, we believe that this suspect has been seen here, and rely less on, on humans, this, this happenstance or happy coincidence of an alert citizen who sees such a car uh, with, with, the, with the suspicious make and model that they're tracking and then alerting the authorities, but instead to say, why can we not use technology in sensible, responsible manners to drive that level of security in this Amber Alert scenario? And the third kind of use case is something that I think we will see a lot more in the future, which is once we've made it see easy enough for any kind of video and related time encoded data to be captured and be made available for processing, what kinds of new automation can we be doing in, in manufacturing, in shipping and logistics, in, in industrial engineering, broadly speaking? And there are, whole, there are a whole bunch of exotic devices that have custom data formats that need to be processed in very specific custom ways. And this was important for us as we built Kinesis video streams to think about the product in a way that made it generalized enough for a whole category of kinds of data types. So let's go into some level of detail about the product. So the core concepts that you need to be aware of are as follows. The inputs into a stream are producers. And these producers uh, are, can be smartphone devices. These, this can be a webcam laptop. This could be uh, a, a, a body-worn camera. This could be a dash camera. This could be a security camera. It could be something a little bit more uh, non-traditional. It could be a depth sensor. It could be a radar feed. It could be a LIDAR feed. And what's Interesting about these kinds of data types that I just rattled off is that uh, what's common to them is this time-encoded nature. And we use the phrase time-encoded to distinguish it just a little bit from time series data, which, which I think a lot of you have, have deep familiarity with. But what distinguishes it is not just the time-orderedness, but the fact that a sample or a frame that, comes, that, that shows up has a dependency on something that came before it and is related in a way that something that comes after it. And for those of you who do video for a living, understand that this is the basis of something like motion compensation. 
as the basis for something that helps us get to a better encoded nature of the video data such that while preserving uh, quality, you can also optimize for the use of given network throughput or bandwidth. So we've got in the system, uh, as part of the service, a producer SDK. The producer SDK is more than a simple wrapper of server-side APIs. The producer SDK that is available in C, C++, Java, and targets for Android with other platform support coming soon is built to integrate by a developer with the media pipeline of the device. So imagine that the encoder that's connected in to the image sensor generates, let's say, an H.264 encoded data, piece of fragment. The Kinesis Video Streams Producer SDK helps the developer package that fragment, securely connect, and stream in that, that video feed uh, into the AWS endpoint. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. So now, data is coming in from this producer into a stream. The stream is the central construct in, in the service. Think of it as you know, your smartphone is generating one video feed, and that one video feed is going into this one Kinesis video stream. As the feed is coming in, you as developers will have the option of saying, I want to consume that video in real time or near real time. And you will do so by using the Get Media API. And the Get Media API allows you to have at the frame level object, which means you can now start building an interesting application that can operate on that frame level data. It doesn't need to be a frame. We can give back an entire fragment and think of a fragment as a group of frames most closely related to a GOP in, in, in the video world, along with lots of associated metadata. That, that, some of that metadata includes the notion of time. Time that is sent by the producer, and time that is registered by the service when it first receives the fragment. And these become useful, useful uh, service-specific metadata that you can then use to traverse through the video stream. So there's the ability to now consume that data in real time. There's a little bit more to that, though. You can say that perhaps for all of my streams, I also want the ability to durably store my data because I have a bunch of applications that don't care about near real-time latency. <coughs> so to do that, you can set a retention period property on, on, on any stream, and you can dial it from one hour to 10 years and change it at any point in time. And when you do that, all the data that is coming in gets durably stored, gets encrypted, and thirdly, we generate an index based on both the timestamp supplied by the original producer as well as the timestamp that is affixed by the Kinesis Video Service when it first receives the data. And so that now gives you a time indexed fragment-based storage system that can then be exposed to any non-latency-sensitive consuming application to retrieve via a get media for fragmentless API. Again, the only resource in the system is a stream. You put to it, and you get from it. You can get from it in real time. You can get from it in non-real time, and you can have as many consumers doing real-time gets, you can have as many consuming applications doing non-real-time gets. What's a consumer? Now that I've introduced that phrase. A consumer, at the end of the day, is an application that gets the media data from the stream and then processes it for its own specific end goal or use case. A simple uh, example here uh, might be motion detection. So all the application does is that it, it retrieves data from the real-time Get Media API and determines that has motion occurred in this specific fragment or not, and perhaps it sends a trigger to somebody else uh, or, or to an interested user. It could be something incredibly more complicated than that. For example, you might have an application that takes an input stream and extracts uh, analyzes the content, so it says, uh, for this 
stream, I'm going to now start creating my own metadata that is based on the number of people wearing blue suede shoes. And what it can do then is extract that metadata from each, each fragment or each frame in the stream and then create a secondary stream, a derived stream, if you will, and then emit this data along with the description of it that says, for these fragments, I saw blue suede shoes. And now suddenly, within the construct of the same system, you have, you have these streams created, these derived streams created, that now other applications that don't want to process the entire st raw stream coming in, but care exclusively about blue suede shoes, know that they have ready and easy access through effectively a GET API. Of course, the fact of the matter is ultimately that these applications are custom and they're yours. You could build them yourself from scratch. You could be building something that takes the GET Media output, uh, uses FFmpeg, which is a common open source uh, video processing toolkit, and uh, go ahead and write your own transcoding capability. You could use uh, any of the uh, emerging and excellent deep learning frameworks on a ad hoc, non-real-time basis to go train your models. You could use Amazon's AI services, like the recognition video service, that has first-party integration with video streams to go uh, detect faces and recognize faces, and with the collection API, send an alert or trigger when you see a person of interest. Or you could work with some of the excellent launch partners that we've been lucky to have with Kinesis Video Streams on the video analytics side who can bring in their own years of expertise and have been wonderful enough to integrate with us to, to deliver their value uh, along with Kinesis Video Streams, and we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, so now let's go to concept number one, a little bit more detail. Uh, the producer SDK. The producer SDK is available in C, C++, Java, Android, uh, with, pla with, fur with further platform support coming soon. Its purpose, ultimately, is to make it much easier than it has been before for a developer to install and customize for their video or time-encoded data generating device to securely connect and stream that data into the AWS endpoint. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the SDK is, is, is built to be aware of the on-device media pipeline. So you should be able to say that here's my image sensor that emits data into an H.264 encoder, H.265 encoder, out pops an encoded bit stream, and this is the interface, the put frame interface that is defined on the producer SDK that can accept the incoming encoded frames, and then it will package up the fragments. It will define the metadata required for the cloud endpoint to accept it. It will make sure that the authentication and authorization required for the device to connect into the cloud is in place. And it will then start actually executing a put media API call to get the data flowing into the Kinesis Video Cloud endpoint. Along the way, it's going to do other things uh, for the developer. It will do token rotation. Because we care deeply about security, all data is TLS encrypted on that wire. The tokens that we use are time bound, which means that after every n minutes, this SDK uh, will, will request a new token so that there is never a very large period of time where the same data has been flowing in. The SDK is also customizable. It is available as open source. So the data doesn't have to be transported in real time. You could have a use case, a very legitimate body-worn camera use case. You don't have network connectivity, which means you're going to be spooling that data on your local device for a little while, minutes, maybe an hour, maybe more. Uh, and the SDK has within, its, uh, within it the construct of a, a content store or a content buffer uh, that you can then customize to say that in the event of a certain specific set of circumstances occurring, I want for the producer SDK to retransmit this data. Or you can say, I want for the producer SDK to drop this bit of data. 
So how we built out the SDK is, is in this layer cake form, if you will. At, at its foundation is a core C-based uh, layer on which we've built C++ and Java-based iterations with further platform support for Android and Linux. And, and as you can tell, we believe that depending on the depending on the customer who is performing this integration, they'll have a natural inclination to pick one or the other flavor of this. And so the goal there, again, has, has been to make it easier uh, for different developer categories and segments to pick the producer SDK that works uh, best for them, while making sure that performance is not compromised. Because when software is running on a device, we definitely do not have uh, the same degrees of freedom that we do when we are running software on, uh, you know, a theoretically infinitely scalable cloud. Okay, so that was the producer SDK. Now let's do a quick walkthrough of the 14 service side APIs that constitute this service. We'll first start with a walkthrough of the core APIs that we at least internally call control plane APIs. This is really all about setting up and managing the, the stream resource. Everything starts with the create stream. As the name suggests, it creates a stream for you. All you need to really supply it is the name. You provision no other underlying resource. You don't say create a stream for 360p, and then, or you don't say create a stream that runs for 14 hours. You don't need to do any of that. You simply say create stream, and this stream will have uh, automatic elasticity, so you could be sending in a 360p at 24 FPS, spike to 4K, drop to 720p, and then do a, a, a mono audio, that's fine. The, the stream will simply scale and shrink, and you will only pay on for, that, for, for that stream now on the data that is being, uh, on, for, for the data that will be ingested. And I'll talk a little bit more about the overall pricing model. But the key thing is, there is no other resource to provision. Uh, delete stream will delete the stream. When you describe the stream, this is a classical control plane API call in, in, in AWS speak at least, and this will return a whole bunch of metadata about the stream. When it was created, what version number it is, uh, what is its status, is it active, is it being created, is it deleting, uh, what's the data retention period for the stream? Is it one hour, 10 years, something in the middle, so on and so forth. Over time, you will have many, 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 many streams and you might want to list those streams in your account. And that is the list streams API. And it also has the ability for you to specify certain filters on it. Because once you start managing, uh, and, uh, uh, managing a service uh, that hopefully you will build that contains hundreds of thousands or millions of streams, you want more uh, uh, interesting ways to manage, that, uh, manage your resources. Uh, the, the, the last API on this slide is, is super interesting for us. Um, it's called Get Data Endpoint, and its purpose is as follows. So there is a producer that wishes to send data to a stream. It doesn't simply say put media with name of the stream. At first, the producer SDK will do all this for you, but it's kind of interesting to know some of the details. The producer SDK is going to say, Get Data Endpoint for this stream, given the stream name, with the intent to write media into the stream. When it does that, the, the, the cloud endpoint is going to say, OK, I see what you want to do. Here's a URI, which corresponds to that request. And then the Put Media API uses that URI and to actually stream the media in. And the same process happens for a consumer. It says, get data endpoint, name of stream, and the intent to read data from that stream. OK. So as I mentioned earlier, you have the ability to set an arbitrarily long or, or small uh, data retention period. And that is captured in the update data retention API. It's important enough for it to, for it to be merited, because when you increase your retention period, what's going to happen is that we're going to simply uh, store that data for longer in your stream. And this is on, on a per stream basis, so you can have one hour on one stream, five years on the other, one month on the third one, if you like. When you decrease retention period, so you go from 30 days to 14 days, something interesting is going to happen. 
the oldest data that is 30 days old is going to get trimmed right down to uh, right down to the 14th day worth of data. So decreasing retention period is effectively a data deletion event. Um, and that's why, given the importance of that, we, we've called it out as a separate API. An update stream API call, on the other hand, is simply for updating other, other stream metadata. The last three APIs in the control plane are tagging-related APIs. You can tag your stream. The stream can have 50 tags. A tag is a key value pair. So, so for example, uh, on the casino, casino floor, there probably are, I don't know, thousands of cameras. So you could have for every camera that is generating one stream, for example, you could say, this is the camera ID. It's uh, based in the casino floor on level two. It is um, on the, uh, it faces poker table number five through number 10 and it's in the high roller arena. And so what this does is it gives you the ability to then list tags and then query those tags to immediately retrieve only those feeds that matter for your application to process. So it becomes really useful building block uh, for you to quickly filter through what streams are, are of interest for you. And of course, you can, the, the tags are, are mutable entities, so you can change the key value pair association of them over time. OK, so now let's talk about, uh, in lots of ways, the heart of the service. At the end of the day, we, from Kinesis Video Streams perspective, have to make it extremely reliable, extremely elastic, and very durable way for you to get data in and get that video data out so that you can then go about building your business. Um, so the first uh, API is the Put Media API. Some of you are probably thinking, hey, what protocol do you use? Because that's probably a very popular question. The Put Media API and its counterpart on the Get side use a streaming HTTPS. We use streaming HTTPS in an interesting way, still compliant with the HTTPS 1.1 spec, by the way. Remember when you call that get data endpoint, you get a URI? That becomes a sticky endpoint for that producer. And once that connection is opened, the producer can stream in multiple fragments on that open connection, which means that you won't pay the overhead of TCP setup and teardown for every put as you might with a typical RESTful API call. So, not only does that streaming HTTPS then allow us to get to a standards compliant way of, of in a relatively lower latency and lower overhead for the producer to transmit data, what we also do is we care about security, which means everything, the S in HTTPS for us is going to be TLS encryption on the wire. So that's important. The third thing is that we also care about reliability. If you've sent a piece of media data, we want to be very sure that it, it made its way to us, and we want to be able to tell the producer. Now, in theory, for anybody who's dealt with networking, you all know that that is a hard problem, and we're not saying we solved it fully, but we've tried to make it a little bit better, and we do that through a system of bi-directional acts. So when the producer is pushing media, for every fragment we receive on the separate channel, we send a received acknowledgement. When you decide that you actually want the data in the stream to be stored, we will send a persistent acknowledgement on, on, that, on that second channel. If you've created a stream and you're not currently putting any media into it, we will say, hey, uh, it's, been, it's been 30 seconds. You asked, for, you asked for a connection. We gave it to you. You haven't put any media. I'm going to send you an idle act. And be warned that in the next 30 seconds, I'm going to terminate this connection. And you'll have to get the data endpoint again if you want to stream. Because you're maintaining sticky endpoints, we have to do some level of connection management because these are going to be millions and millions and millions of devices that are all going to be starting to pump data into the system. So that's something unique about the put media API instantiation. And again, when you use the producer SDK, all the stuff is taken care of you, taken care of for you. So it's highly recommended then uh, that you start that use that as a starting point. Of course, ultimately, the API and its reference is published, and you can do, do the same, uh, but we recommend using the producer SDK. The get media is the counterpart for put media. 
Now, this is when a consuming application that cares about relatively low latency, continuous consumption of the output of a Get Media API call. Uh, you, it specifies the name of the stream, and it says uh, the start time or the start fragment by which it wants to start playing the consuming the media data into it. Its non-latency sensitive counterpart is Get Media for Fragment List. Now, this API says that I'm going to assume that you have decided to store the data. And what I want, now want to do is replay data from the past for whatever reason. And, and, and I don't want to replay it in a continuous fashion in the sense that I don't want to necessarily say, give me fragment 10 and 9 and 8 and 7 and 6 and 5 until I get to fragment 1. But instead, what I want to do is I want to list out all the fragments and then do a parallel download. Because it so happens that my processing task can be distributed in that manner, and I don't need to do a sequential processing. Of course, if I'm trying to do video playback, then you want to do sequential processing, which you can also do. But if you want to do parallel distributed processing, you could do, you could do that as well with the Get Media for Fragment List API. And so, so Get Media and Get Media for Fragment List are then this real-time and non-real-time counterparts for, uh, for accessing data that is present in your streams. And the last API over there, List Fragments, is the companion to Get Media for Fragment List. Because Get Media for Fragment List is going to say, what stream? OK. What fragments do you want me to return for you? And you, you determine that using the List Fragments API for the stream. OK, so that was a bit of a, a whirlwind tour. But hopefully, you get a sense sense for uh, what are the core APIs in the system. And then lastly, uh, uh, we also have an open source parser library, which makes it easy for any custom application that you create to work with the output of the media stream. Now, remember when I said that get media can return frames? Well, what does that really mean? Well, you need to understand what is a frame object. And you need to understand, hey, what is, for example, the timestamp associated with it? And this stream parser library contains within it uh, a set of, of individual software-based tools and utilities to, to get, extract a frame. You can extract a fragment. You can extract metadata associated with a frame or a fragment. What you can also do is that you can say, looks like these fragments, when they share the same metadata, because sometimes that happens, I want you to simply concatenate all of these fragments so that a next stage in my video processing workflow can be made simpler. And the key thing here, again, is that you will build amazing sets of applications that I would wager that we can only dream of today, if that. And it was important for us then to think about the system in this flexible manner such that if you decide to pick a flavor of the next amazing deep learning framework that hasn't been invented as of this show, but I'm sure there'll be 10 more the next time we meet, we want you to have the ability to still use the system without getting bogged down into data format X um, or, or protocol Y and still keep things as, as, as generalized as possible for you. OK, so how do we charge? Uh, Kinesis Video Streams is available uh, as of yesterday in five regions, uh, US East, US West, Oregon specifically, in our, uh, in our Dublin region, in a, in a region in Frankfurt, as well as in Tokyo. And we charge in a purely uh, pay-as-you-go manner based on the amount of data ingested, the amount of data consumed by your custom processing application or applications, and the amount of data that is stored across all your streams. It doesn't matter if you have a billion cameras or one. We don't want you to pay for the number of cameras that you have and devices that are currently streaming. We want it to be truly uh, pay-as-you-go, so when the data is actually sent in is when the, the meter starts running for data ingested. Similarly, you may have a relatively simple use case. You may have just one consumer that is running a transcoding job, for example, and then pushing it into a CDN like CloudFront to do some sort of a, your own homegrown Twitch, your own homegrown Periscope application, because you can now start doing those sort of things because of some of these services. Now, in that, for, in that scenario, you have just one consuming application. You want to pay per gigabyte at that low rate. 
if you're building uh, an amazing set of 200 different applications that are all going to be consuming streams at different rates and speeds and feeds, and then that means that it becomes truly pay as you go, because hopefully that is value for you. And then lastly, on the data short, some of you may notice that the price point is exactly the same as S3. And we did that for a reason. We will do the fragment-oriented storage. We will generate the index based on producer server-side timestamp. We will keep that data encrypted. We will expose it through the Get Media for Fragment APIs, get that integration going with several AI services and more. But we don't want to charge more. So the idea here is that, sure, can all of you here build systems like these? I think with enough time and energy and investment? Possibly. But why would you if we are able to provide you something that helps tackle some of those tasks? OK. Uh, this has been something that we've been uh, trying to work on from an ecosystem perspective. Uh, and we are very fortunate that we got to work with, uh, with Agent VI. Um, they are uh, a cloud-based a video analytics software as a service company that offers a wide range of capabilities, ranging from detection of security and safety incidents in real time uh, to expedited investigations that require automated video search capabilities and more. By using, uh, uh, they've been, with our partnership with the Agent VI team, they've been able to extend this uh, their, their video analytics solutions uh, such that any IP security surveillance camera that interoperates with Kinesis video streams is now be able to instantly analyze in the Agent VI cloud, uh, cloud offering, uh, which is pretty exciting. And, and you, can, you can see how a whole bunch of different customers, uh, especially public safety-oriented, security, surveillance-oriented to, you know, to keep uh, airports safe, to keep uh, citizens safe, uh, now have the option of saying, we can use the cloud with a world-class solution set that comes together. Uh, this is just kind of a, a quick diagram for how uh, Agent VI's solution is integrated with, with Kinesis video streams. Uh, on the actual uh, camera, uh, there is the uh, uh, Kinesis Video Streams producer that's running, does the packaging and is streaming the video through the Video Streams product that is then relayed into the Agent VI system, uh, which is built on AWS, and it touches a whole bunch of different AWS services as they deliver their, their video security as a service solution uh, for all customers. Uh, another partner that we've been uh, working with since uh, since quite early on, is Veritone. And Veritone are uh, an AI and cognitive solutions provider. And uh, they have a suite of applications. And, and for them, they use a uh, uh, hundred plus different cognitive engines, um, you know, facial recognition, object recognition, transcription, sentiment detection. Um, and they combine all these engines to generate uh, what they call time-correlated multidimensional metadata from linear files, which neatly describes a lot of video. And, and with our uh, partnership with Veritone, uh, customers can now have at a, a number of different data types, including video, and use Veritone's uh, engine uh, that they call AIware to then both on a real-time as well as on a near real-time basis, apply a combination of different cognitive engines to, to analyze that video data. So again, we consider ourselves very, very fortunate uh, in having uh, worked through with some of these partners and building joint solutions to the marketplace. Now, I'm so excited uh, to, uh, to have a wonderful uh, customer that we've been working with through our entire private beta process uh, join me on stage today. Uh, the customer's name is Abeja, and representing them is uh, Yosuke Okada, the 28-year-old founder and CEO, and, um, and, and Kawasaki-san, who is our 27-year-old uh, lead uh, platform engineer for Abeja, who performed 
who are one of the leading Japanese AI platform providers uh, for retailers, and hundreds of merchants use their capabilities to drive vision-based analytics and sensor analytics uh, uh, using their offerings. And, uh, and they're gonna tell us a little bit more uh, about themselves and their work with Kinesis Video Streams, and we're gonna see what I think is just a really cool demo. So, with, for, with no further ado, Okara-san. Thank you for a great introduction, Adi. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. My name is Yosuke Okada. I'm founder and CEO of Aveja Incorporated. Yeah. Thank you for a great opportunity today. Yeah. I'm so exciting. Yeah. So firstly, I'd like to talk about my company, Aveja, and Aveja's product firstly. Yeah. Aveja is established in 2012 September, yeah, and headquarter is in Tokyo and Singapore. Our mission and product image are industrial structure transformation using deep learning technology. And our employees are around about 70 people. Yeah, 70 people, yeah. And 70% engineers, yeah. And our business is like a platform business and a software as a service business model, yeah. After that, I introduced like a platform as a service business, yeah. And our stockholder is like an NVIDIA Salesforce, yeah. So uh, American big IT vendors invested in our company, yeah. So this is like an average platform. This is our platform as a service product, yeah. So this is a IoT and AI platform system, yeah. So the system is connected to the many, many sensors, IoT sensors in real world, in physical world, yeah. And connect to the like, stream and batch process to the cloud, yeah. And other system connect to the API based connect on <coughs> AWS S3 based, yeah. And after that, uh, using these big data and trained on distributed cloud training system, yeah. And after that, uh, on training, after training, yeah, and deploy to the cloud inference, to edge inference. And after that, uh, data for inference is to go to the cloud inference phase, yeah. And after that, uh, inference data uh, saved to the data analytics system. And the system is uh, pushed to the real field, there. Yeah. For example, many, many IoT actuator and motors control there. Yeah. And connectivity and uh, other services uh, by API connect to base. This is our abstract of average platform, yeah. So next year, I'd like to explain uh, how to connect like a Kinest video stream in Avija platform, yeah. So this is a very, very simple overview here. Yeah. Cameras, IoT cameras and mobile device connectivity with, using the Kinest video stream on AWS. And we supply to the like ECS-based deep learning inference phase there, yeah, and plus tracking system here. Yeah. Tracking is very important in movie track, uh, movie deep learning inference base there. Yeah. And after that, saved on DynamoDB, and output is like a manufacturing and a retail use case. For example, manufacturing use case, either like a preventive maintenance and, and visual inception and automatic picking, yeah. For example, retail use, uh, use case like a visual merchandising through video analytics, yeah, and measures the effect of marketing. This is a very simple, yeah. And we supply to the, like uh, some Kinest data stream, yeah. So it is like a, it is not only camera, it is not only movie data, but also many many data, yeah. So the IoT sensor connect Kinest base there, and we supply to the deep learning inferences, yeah, and the DynamDB. And now this is like uh, the overview of the Avisha platform, yeah. So it's a like connectivity of on-premise data center, uh, on-premise GPU cluster data center, yeah. So uh, training on the GPU and deploy to the ECS, yeah. So it's very easy. So it is like a very, very simple architecturing, yeah, our Avisha platform in Kine uh, with Kinesis video stream, yeah. And today, I'd like to, using this architecture, I'd like to uh, show real-time uh, live real time demo, yeah. So I'd like to introduce uh, Average Platform, uh, Platform Division Lead Engineer, Toshia Kawasaki. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so in this live demonstration, uh, we will uh, show the real time. Uh, video capture through the Kinesis, then Avengers Air Platform estimate the uh, demographic information in the stream in real time, and the 
display the result video on the management console, right? Uh, so, oh. So this is the Kinesis videos management console. And there is some stream right here and move to the DM stream. Okay. Oh. Okay, there is some DA but uh so so as you can see, this model estimates the age and gender from the uh, faces. So now it shows that I'm uh, between 25 and 30 now. So actually, I'm I'm uh, tw uh, sorry, 27 years old, and yes, it's close. <laughs> so it's like demo. So next point to Yosuke. Uh, in fact, I'm 28. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, go go left. <laughs> so it is not a uh, separate uh, control like a lightning environment. Yeah. Uh, it's not good. <laughs> so next, uh, so try try it with other people. So please come. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it's it, it's detect more people even if there is more people. Okay, great. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> After that, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay, so how it how it works? So this is the uh, architecture of demonstration, and uh, first uh, the left side uh, we use the GStreamer based producer that running on my Mac, and that captures the video stream to Kinesis, and then uh, second uh, as the video stream goes through the Kinesis, uh, Avengers app. Uh, platform estimates the age and gender uh, in the stream in real time uh, using the Kinesis uh, video stream passing library uh, that, that fetches and decodes the frame uh, of the stream. And third, uh, after the detection is made, another DStream app based producer sends the processed image uh, along with the bounding box that, and the annotation that you, see, you, saw, you saw to the uh, another Kinesis video stream uh, display in the management console. So this is how it works. And our impression of Kinesis video stream, so while uh, we are building that demonstration, we didn't have to worry about the infrastructure of the video stream at all. And uh, using Kinesis videos SDK, we didn't, uh, uh, sorry, so we were able to get the frame from Kinesis in very real time, so it, it's like me second delay. And so by using Kinesis video stream, uh, we were able to uh, focus on developing uh, deep learning applications. And so I believe that uh, this will make it uh, easier for us to to integrate and build the real-time video analytics applications. Right, thank you. Thank you, Kara san and Kawasaki san. Uh, so I just want to kind of wrap up here, and, uh, and we'll be around for any questions. Uh, but as, as Roger mentioned in the beginning, we've been on this journey for, with streaming data for about five years, and a lot of customers said, wow, you guys are working a lot of discrete event data streams, but 
it really isn't video what streaming is about, is that where the brain goes to immediately. And, and, and I guess uh, our, our journeys kind of come, come to that stage now, that, we, that with Kinesis video streams, uh, along with the other Kinesis services, you can now catch a process and store video streams for a variety of different analytics and machine learning um, applications. Thank you very much for your time. We're around for a few more minutes uh, in case you want to talk and ask questions or in case you need to go run into another, and wait another line because uh, that's happening a lot here. I respect that. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.